I reckon we're going to work on into it just before we get back because we're, we're getting a little bit late and so we, we do want to keep this to under an hour so um, we'll see how we go. So um, my name's Greg O'Brien, I'm on the um, trust that look after Petuna Chapel. Um, I've been on the trust for about 10 years so um, I've been here on a number of occasions when Jim Allen was here on the 50th anniversary of the chapel um, on the very auspicious day in 2014 when the Christ figure was returned to Petuna Chapel after 12 years um, in the wilderness, really, as many of you will know, Jim's uh, carving the mahogany Christ was um, taken from this, at the time, derelict chapel and uh, was found in a, um, in a, in a milking shed in a, on a farm just outside New Plymouth. Um, so anyway, so Jim was here then. Jim was someone that seemed to me to have a great feeling for this building. It's, it was a long way back in his history. The, the, the church, the chapel, as you know, was opened in 1960, so I guess Jim would have been in his... 30s when he um, when he worked on it, a relatively young man early in his career because he changed a lot after that, of course. Um, so anyway, so anyway, I'm, I'm here to welcome you back. I'm going to introduce the panel. I've got quite a few questions for them, but it'd be great if um, the audience could be involved too because I know we've got mem members of Jim's family here. We've got members of John Scott's family. We've got people here, um, including Robin White, who um, were taught by J Jim, Jim Allen at Elam School of Fine Arts. So we've got students, friends, family, um, and of course there are a number of members of the uh, Fortuna Trust here too, who knew, knew and actually worked with Jim Allen really on the, on the um, preservation of this building. Anyway, so I'm going to introduce you very quickly to the panel, then we're going to th throw it around and talk about a few ideas to do with Jim Allen and John Scott and the building. Um, Tim Barlow's on my extreme left here, so you have all been experienced his um, piece of performance um, art earlier in the program today. He's Wellington based, um, solid academic credentials, great performer too. Um, Phil Dadson, again, I don't need to reintroduce Phil, um, musician, installation artist, painter, um, Renaissance man, yes, I think I can say that. <laughs> Um, Tina Barton, of course, is a leading academic and writer about art history and New Zealand art. Um, so it's great to have Tina here and uh, my good pal Elizabeth Thompson, um, who um, is a, is a um, sculptor and installation artist and, um, and a terrific person. So um, anyway, I think um, without any further ado, I thought I'd talk to Phil first. I mean, Phil opened the concert, but um, also, I mean, Phil did have a lot of contact with Jim Allen over the years, I guess from the time you were a student. But, my question is really, you know, Phil, when you um, come to a place like Fortuna, what do you see of Jim Allen in here and what do you feel? Are there any salient ingredients in Fortuna Chapel that t tell us about who Jim was and what he was thinking and what he was doing? It's, uh, I think it's a synthesis of his, um, his fascination with, with light and space. And uh, Jim was an innovator in many ways. Um, one, of his, one of his essential innovations was the, light mod the concept of the light modulator. And it was a, uh, a, a plaster of Paris sculpture that he carved niches in to, to let light in in different ways that refracted and um, and, and actually affected not only the form of the, the block, but um, affected the space around it. And when he had the opportunity, I understand, when he had the opportunity to do this commission, um, there was talk about how to, how to really bring light into the space in a, in a way that would be constantly um, transforming in terms of the uh, the stained glass window that he designed, um, the Stations of the Cross, and he incorporated the light modulator idea into, into, these, um, into these panels particularly, so that they actually have, they have a three-dimensional depth and a dimension to them that, um, that kind of refracts and changes with the changing light. There's a beautiful passage, actually, that's uh, recorded in, in the book, his book, the book about Jim, Skin of the Years, which I had the privilege of um, interviewing Jim for. Uh, 
um, where at the completion of this building um, and everything was finally in place, they were awaiting the rising of the sun. And um, I think it was at a certain point in the day, they wanted to see exactly how the, how the light kind of affected and refracted and kind of diffused through the space. And there's a, a delightful passage in the book where it just describes the architects and everybody who's involved here um, being stunned to sil in, a, in silence, just sort of by the unexpected, unexpected way the light worked. So I think that was very due to, to Jim's influence, yeah. 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 There is actually in the Fortuna book on page 40, there is a picture of um, Fortuna Chapel as John Scott had designed it just before Jim Allen became involved. So it's quite an interesting um, drawing because you see Jim actually did come in and um, really I think with John Scott working incredibly closely and passionately together they did deliver the chapel into its final form but in the drawing which you can see in the book um, there are no patterns on the window to speak of at that point. Um, you know, there were no stations of the cross like that, no light modulators. Um, so Jim did bring in some really kind of fresh, radical elements, and they did become part of the architecture, and also, of course, the cross that we mentioned too. Um, originally with the cross, um, apparently um, Jim and John Scott wanted the, the figure of Christ to be basically nailed onto the wall itself, so the, the building became sort of implicated in that whole thing. But apparently theologically or... The, the, the powers that be in the church said, no, you can't do that, you can't put a man on the wall, he has to be on a cross, so the cross was put in a bit later. Um, thanks, Bill. Um, Tina, I mean, in terms of New Zealand art history, um, what do you think about this, this early, I suppose it is an early phase in Jim Allen's work, still working as a wooden sculpt, sculptor, but moving towards light and space and um, more immaterial concerns. Um, what, what, what do you sort of respond to here, and what do you think is interesting about it. Well, my immediate thought sitting here and experiencing the performances today is that um, this would have been, uh, Jim would so have enjoyed this because um, the space lends itself to creative activity and I think as a container, isn't it lovely that people can come together, witness something and witness something that is um, generative and exciting. I think he would have really, really enjoyed seeing it being used in the way that it is. Um, <clears throat> when I s approached Jim Allen as an artist, I was a master's student at the University of Auckland trying to document uh, what I felt might be a, a disappearing history of what I called post-object art, which was and I think you might ask me to define that, but which was the sort of work that didn't necessarily survive its first presentation, whether it was performance or sound or video or whatever. And there was this rich history in Auckland, so much of which Jim had fostered and nurtured. Um, and I was discovering it not in the museums and galleries, but in the libraries, like Elam Library or the research library at Auckland Art Gallery on bits of paper and photographs and talking to people and I wanted to sort of secure this and I was really fascinated by Jim's work after 1969 through that incredible change that he underwent after he'd been away overseas and that was the period that I was most interested in. Um, so coming to Futuna I'm seeing something before that transition, but when I'm here, and I think about this in relation to some of the public sculptures he's done in other places, I see all of the, um, the elements that uh, enable him to then move on to what he did in the 70s, and I think it has got very much to do with what Phil was talking about in terms of playing with these immaterial qualities like light. Um, working collaboratively with the architect to create something that was um, more than the sum of its parts. 
Um, but I do see this as transitional in terms of his practice. So, you know, here's a carving, here are works that he's physically made, here are sculptural elements that are integrated into this three-dimensional space um, that he's crafting, he's still making, he's still, um, you know, energetically working on. So I see it as um, a sculptor at work in, but in a new environmental context. Does that make sense? That's, that's great. Um, so, so did you know Jim as a person, or did you? Um, I, I went to Sydney and interviewed him when he was still at Sydney College. Um, that would have been in about 1984 or 85. And I was a very shy art history student who went to, tapped on the door of the head of school and we had a lovely conversation there. Um, and he told me many years later that I was the first person from New Zealand um, to come and find him to talk about the work that he had made in New Zealand before he left. Because this was, this, this was a, a very sort of a particular moment where Jim had left New Zealand and wasn't actively making work. Of course, he was... Um, leading an art, a, a very innovative art school, and actually his, um, it was still part of his work, but he wasn't having exhibitions per se. And so, um, to, to some extent, I feel that I was um, part of a project to sort of rediscover him, mm. that um, I started to work on in the early 80s, but it was much later, really, when he came back to New Zealand, and a, and a much younger generation began to really take an interest. Mm. Um, and I, I feel so proud of the fact that he is now recognized as an important figure in our history, um, one that is, that is still quite hard to, you know, um, categorize and, mm. and, and, and put into the canon, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I did meet him and kept in touch with him afterwards. Very honoured to have attended his 100th birthday. Uh, and, of course, came up for his memorial at the Auckland Art Gallery yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, Tim, down the end, I mean, what, what's your awareness of, of um, Jim Allen? I mean, uh, looking at your piece, I was amazed, impressed, really, with, I guess, the kind of strong, visceral dramatic element. Um, it does seem to hark back to some of the works that Jim Allen was making post Fortuna, these sort of works like Contact to do with, um, um, you know, um, happenings to do with performance art, um, but, but quite quite visceral stuff too. Uh, yeah, well, um, I first, I mean, I never met uh, Jim. Um, I first came in to, uh, had developed some knowledge about his work probably in the 80s at some point I saw the book um, New Art, Some Post-Object Art and Sculpture in New Zealand by Whiston Kurnu and Jim Allen, um, which sort of combined sculpture with post-object practices. It was a real combination in itself and quite a hard to find book these days, I think. But that influenced me, it sort of, as a, a high school student or a young um, art student, um, to me, that was the first time I had actually seen performance art going on in New Zealand, and it kind of legitimated, even though I was aware of, um, say, US performance art and stuff, it, it, it legitimated and enabled me to try some um, performance work at, at that early time. Um, and yes, I suppose coming into this this contact, uh, the, the performance contact from 1974, with its three parts, which I, I sort of loosely developed this performance around that. Um, you know, I always loved looking at the pictures of it, and it, and it seemed to typify the way perhaps uh, a, a lot of young artists in New Zealand learned about stuff through books and pictures um, without actually um, seeing the performances, experiencing the liveness or the actual site or place. 
Um, yeah, and when I came in here, uh, talked with um, Dan about doing a performance, um, uh, you know, I was looking at the light and um, watching, actually watching it slow down time, I was like, light is durational, you know, I was, I was seeing if I could see it move up the little shadows there and thinking of it as, a, as creating these transitions um, as it lit different surfaces and objects. And um, I kind of liked that there was also a narrative, strong narrative element in the church with the stations, um, the light modulators. Uh, I sort of based really the, the key part of the performance around, I sort of tried to turn it round and turn light into sound rather than the, the light um, sort of uh, being the leader in a way. Um, yeah, I uh, don't know if that answered no, no, the that's question. But I guess um, perhaps we can flip back to Phil for a second. I mean, there is such an element of theatre, I guess, in Jim Allen. I mean, even from very early on with, with I mean, when he was doing these works, I mean, he backlit he did the modulators and he based the Stations of the Cross, which are telling a story. He based the, the kind of form of them on, and the materials, their plaster of Paris, on the kind of um, mod light modulators that he'd be making. Mm. But there is something very theatrical about it. I mean, even at that point, I think, and to me, I'm just thinking about the performances that we've had today. Obviously, that's the legacy of Jim Allen is about a multifaceted theatre that brings together light, sound, words and often poetry right you know and, you know, yeah. and texts and you know both um, yours and Tim's case you know bringing in bringing in words bringing in technology like megaphones new technology old technology stones and megaphones you know um, um, and, but but the art is a kind of happening it is a theatrical event a happen oh, and happening would be a word that was used you know yeah, yeah. Um, I think well Jim was <coughs> very um, empathetic with kind of developments that were happening in performance where people were starting to work together and particularly in open space like mm. when we started a project called um, Solar Plexus which was a dawn to dusk drumming event in Mount Eden Crater. Um, <clears throat> Jim was incredibly supportive and got involved with that and various, you know, various artists were using that as a platform like Bruce Barber and others and Jim did his first big megaphone piece on the edge of the crater so they had four pieces, four people in different parts of the, on the rim of the crater, each one representing a different discipline. Like it was, I think, somebody from um, medicine, representing a med the medicine kind of science, science of medicine, something of philosophy, something of um, cuisine, and something, I just forget what the other one, anthropology, yeah. yeah. So there were different texts that were read simultaneously across the crater, you know, and that was part of his, his, his sense of drama and, and the dramatics of space mm. too, you know, and I think that after he went overseas <clears throat> in the late 60s, at 68, he saw a lot of work and, um, and had an enthusiasm for absorbing it. Mm. And um, he came back re-energised in a, in a way that kind of shifted, shifted the whole dimension of sculpture at Elam um, it took a little time, but he he just opened the he opened the doors and um, expanded the boundaries, and um, he let people fly with it. And that was Jim's approach to education, mm. was not to interfere, but to create openings and opportunities. And he did that for very generously with um, all his students. You know, it was um, that was to me that was one of the most positive and sort of generous things that he did. He, 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 was a, um, he was a strong, silent man. He didn't say a hell of a lot, mm. Jim, but he created, he created a lot of very important openings and opportunities. Yeah. Did, did he face much opposition, I mean, at that time? Yeah, the... <laughs> he did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, particularly, um, I mean, we can imagine, you know, within a university context too, everybody's very territorial. And, um, and everybody's very dependent on funding, you know, to kind of develop their territories. Well, when you get somebody who comes in and says, let's dismantle the territories, and in fact, I'm going to use a bit of your territory and mine, um, this is starting to create a little bit of competition, and um, people are starting to feel, hey, 
uh, my funding might get you know might get reduced a bit if I start giving too much in that territory. So, mm. you know, there was a bit of antipathy, um, but you know, Jim was strong. He's a strong man, <laughs> and uh, you know, against all resistance, he just kind of you know he had a commitment and he just kept things moving. Yeah. He was a mover shaker. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, Liz Thompson, I guess. Um, yeah, in terms of, you're, you're probably a couple of generations on, I guess, from, from Jim Allen, um, went through Elam at a later stage, and I guess I keep thinking, you know, you probably got a version of Phil Dadson as a kind of a, someone who was carrying a kind of a torch or a flame from the Jim Allen days, but I mean, I guess you're someone that, in a way, the word post-object doesn't apply to you because you still do make objects. Um, but at the same time, to me, your, the, your concerns as an artist are totally a lot of them are those to do with post-object art, to do with um, space and effects and refractions of light. It's not to do with pictorial space. It's not to do with 3D sculpture. But I mean, d d so as a figure, are you aware of him or aware of that legacy at Elam when you were there? So perhaps tell us when you were at Elam first and, and who. <coughs> so I was at Elam, um, yes, I'd been traveling overseas a lot. And um, um, actually, it was when I was in the bush on the west coast of the South Island. Um, <clears throat> I was sort of in between stage um, and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Went into the bush with these uh, possum hunters and uh, took up, uh, they used to sharpen my pencils and I started drawing. And I was kind of, that was my sort of a pivotal point for me. And I went overseas and traveled on, um, you know, on the back of a Norton commander across Mexican deserts and things. <laughs> And, um, and so I felt when I um, came back to New Zealand, um, I had encouragement from my mum and sister to go to university, and so I had to go back to bursary, do bursary art, and then I went to Elam, and I was there for uh, six years, so I did my master's. Um, so I started there in 83. Um, so Jim Mellon, I wasn't really, um, particularly didn't really know about him, but um, what I, uh, loved about Elam was that it was a really hard place, but it was actually of your own making as to um, so that I'm sure there was that legacy of um, uh, people had to find their own voice basically and you're encouraged to work really hard and he uh, from what I gather to he was encouraging people to use um, what was around them um, materials and you know and I, I found, I, I chose uh, printmaking, but I actually was really kind of straddled all the, um, the departments. And I used to kind of walk around a lot and go into sculpture, talk to Phil. And, um, and so I was really sort of fascinated with um, everything else. But um, at that time, I, I asked if I could be in another department, you know, at, at the same time. And they said, no, no, you've got to really stick to one. But um, Alberto Garcia Alvarez, who was at the same, um, lecturing at the same time as Jim, um, from he was from Barcelona. He actually, so he kind of, maybe he was influenced by Jim, I don't know, but he sort of encouraged uh, in printmaking for us, uh, for me to be, um, you know, painting using photography and he'd get very, very excited about um, um, people kind of working hard and, as I say, developing your own voice and working at scale um, and trying different things. And, and so I did, I ended up kind of working in, you know, in photography and, and sculpture and painting all at the same time and have ever since. Um, and so I, you know, it was great in, in the library, I could put up things on the walls and, um, and uh, it was a really, really good time for me. I just you know, had to work really hard. I'd work till three in the morning often. Um, and worked in the foundry at the same time as well. But uh, when, I, when I left Elam, actually I thought that um, I was kind of a little bit bound, no sorry, I did my um, BFA and then uh, um, and I was doing um, <coughs> um, et photo etching and I was <coughs> making dioramas. And, um, sorry, my voice has just gone. <laughs> Keep going, no, yes, <coughs> I was making dioramas in my studio because uh, I decided I'd do that for my master's dissertation. And then I had contact with Greer, Greer Twist as my supervisor. And he, <coughs> he started, um, so he was there at the same time as Jim. And he said, okay, you need to start looking at not just museum dioramas, but, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> artist tableaus and um, 
And so it sort of kind of really expanded my thinking in terms of space and um, elements occupying space and um, significance and insignificance. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, it was interesting. One of the events here, I think it was when the, the Christ figure came back to um, Fortuna after its 12 year absence. Pretty sure on that occasion, but that was when Greer Twist and Jim Allen were here. And I thought that was they're an interesting pair, really, because in some ways, you know, um, Jim Allen, I guess, who taught at Elam, you know, both of them had taught at Elam back in the day, sort of thing. Um, but they seemed very brotherly in terms of, you know, who they were and how they sat together. Um, and Jim Allen, I guess, represented that kind of post object art. Greer Twist, you know, kept casting bronze when he could, was quite a traditional artist. And I do remember a conversation with them about the. Um, when, when, the, when Christ got stolen from the chapel, the, um, the bronze um, crown of thorns was lost forever, so he couldn't get it back. And the original crown of thorns was built by, was mold, made by Jim Allen, uh, but he wasn't doing that work anymore, so Greer Twist made the crown of thorns to put back on the head of Christ up there. Um, but I sort of thought, um, to what extent did, did Jim Allen want to throw out the old art, or did, was it, did he wanted to ac accommodate it within what was going on? Maybe Phil, that'd be a good question for you. Yeah. I mean, because it seemed to me he, in his old age anyway, in his very wise old age, it seemed there seemed to be just a great energy and bond between this, uh, these old ways of working and this, you know, new ways. I think no, I think he was um, he was very accommodating. You know, so I mean, I, I think he he fully respected the tradition, but he just wanted to create the, you know, the 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 avenue for exploring exploration. Mm. So, um, and also working alongside Greer, he had you know he he actually appointed Greer as a as a lecturer, mm. um, and Greer you know came from a a casting base, so. Um, yeah, no, that was always respected. And in fact, before Greer came, um, Jim had experimented with with casting at the school a little unsuccessfully. But I mean, he 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 was keen to bring in all those kind of traditions so that people actually experienced it, mm. all the all the different aspects of sculpture. I mean, there's a hell of a lot to learn in sculpture in terms of materials and how you put things together and um, all the different processes. And he explored that through his public artworks. Mm. And so that was kind of, you know, something that he was constantly in a process of um, acquiring skills as he as he developed. Mm. And um, he never really abandoned, or I wouldn't say he ever rejected that, that those, those skills from, you know, uh, from other people, mm. other people's kind of a practice. So um, he just, he respected it, but, um, took off in his own directions, yeah. you know, in parallel, kind of complementary, yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Phil. Um, well, here's a question, but probably for Tina and Tim. I mean, the human body in performance art and in post-object art, and I, thinking about Jim Allen in the chapel here where we've got him making a larger-than-life mahogany, you know, sort of a very dramatic figure of Christ, but then as his performance art emerged, or, you know, the, um, happenings and things by the late 60s into the 70s. You have human bodies in rooms, human beings um, um, presented as the art object themselves. I'm just kind of wondering, kind of like, what was his, was it a visceral fascination with the body? Is it, what, what's, it what's it all about? Perhaps Tina, could you tell, tell us what's going on? Because possibly some people are, might be mystified um, a little bit. And I also think, Tim, perhaps with your piece too, because that was quite a visceral piece. And also, I mean, the, the, the human beings are actors, you know, they're, dramatic presences in a room and they affect the audience, you know, the same way the figure of Christ does. But, um, yeah, perhaps could you tell us about what was that about? Um. Well, you know, as an art historian, one's um, in the business of constructing narratives that explain the development of art over time. And art historians love um, both continuities and breaks. Um, so, you know, there's one version that would go that, you know, um, in the late 60s and 70s, artists turned away from making objects um, because they wanted um, to avoid the idea that an object was simply a precious object to be sold in the market or, you know, contained by a museum. And they wanted to re-engage with the social realm. And one way of doing that was to 
abandon um, the precious object and to use whatever was at hand, uh, including their own bodies. So there was a rejection of the traditional way in which materials had been approached um, as materials to be formed into something to be looked at and therefore consumed to this other way of working which was uh, in the moment and social um, and that does suggest a break. But of course, when Greg, you're describing the connection between the figure of Christ here and say, Phil um, standing here in the space, they are both human bodies. One is represented and one is sort of real and there. And there is that deeper continuity which I think exists. So uh, what we're really talking about is the field of art, right? The, the space that um, we choose to operate in where we are thinking and behaving symbolically. And that's what's important rather than um, drawing these sharp distinctions and imagining one person uh, occupying one place in this linear history and another person occupying a different place and somehow them not actually being part of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm getting slightly sort of philosophical here, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but um, I do see those continuities. When you think about where Jim in his very last years went back to making paintings and um, making objects. So there's, you know, it's not like he's relinquishing some duty to the post object. Mm -hmm. He is continuing to work through a set of problems yeah. um, and find the appropriate solution for him at that stage in his life. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just chip in a little bit there? I think so much to do with ideas, isn't it? And Jim was responsive to new technology and um, he was, he embraced developments in science and, uh, and particularly technology that was creeping in electronics, for example. Um, he, was, he was just so open to kind of utilizing those and putting them into his art and kind of encouraging it. I mean, it was happening around the world, um, internationally, but he, um, kinetics were kind of a big thing for him because it was a, a kind of logical development to take form and shape and then to actually in include movement. Mm -hmm. And so movement was something that was, you know, being explored at the time when Jim was traveling. And, you know, he kind of met up with Len Lai, for example, in New York, and um, they were friends, and he had a good opportunity to see what Len was exploring. And he was a, a follower of people like Takis and others, you know, who were kind of really exploring the, the potential of kinetic art. And so that, that was another aspect, and that kind of influenced the idea of, you know, the body, mm. using the body kinetically, yeah. Yeah, I, <coughs> I see that, um, that connection with technology and communication as a really <coughs> strong thread in Jim Allen's uh, work. And he seemed to be trying so many different, sort of methodologies or techniques like from contact which seemed like a very much a body performance in a in a very multi-sensory body performance which I, I loved that it was activating so many senses with within the space that um, really Jim was addressing new problems that the artist was interested in. Um, how do you uh, get people, an audience, to reflect on the new issues or the, the important um, uh, changes that were going on because of the introduction of technology and communication, um, I think, really preoccupied Jim could be a central sort of theme, and he might try the contact, multi-sensory, physical body performance, and then a year later he's um, using really basic materials, uh, might be photostats or photocopies and sheets of plastic, and 
um, everyday materials just randomly thrown. He's really, I found that very liberating to work with as an artist for one. Um, but also he uh, is very pragmatic uh, and practical in the way he goes about addressing the concerns that he sees um, are important. And I think the communication is like, uh, you know, being bombarded with information and, and, that, and all these new technologies of, of TV, television, tape recordings, um, infrared beams, all these things he threw into um, a performance like Contact. Uh, and, and to see what would happen if you kind of started layering them all on top of each other and screening the video of the performance just after it happened in the, for the, as the second act of the performance went. And really quite, um, you know, to me it's like he was thinking about the instantaneousness of communication and what it was bringing about. And, um, uh, looking at it philosophically, and I mean, now we're just in a sort of state of that to the power of a million, you know, it's just ramped up that sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think he's very prescient. Of, so know, with your piece, Tim, I mean, can you tell us just briefly, I mean, basically you wanted to engage all our senses because you used the sense of smell, for instance, didn't you? I mean, with mm -hmm. the in church incense, um, there's a lot of touching and sense of, you know, connection with musical instruments, with objects, there's sound, there's um, spoken word, there's, um, um, so in a way I guess you're doing the whole thing, almost trying to run the gamut of all the human senses and in a work of art, <laughs> which, is, which is a Jim Allen <coughs> thing, right, which is also, I suppose, a thing you could take back to the Middle Ages and early Catholicism with the whole notion of a, you kind of re a religious ritual too, mm. in terms of it wanting to, music, sound, voice, smell, touch, um, presence in a room? Yeah, well, also the, the church, uh, as you say, you know, that is the, the sort of um, precursor to uh, uh, the multi-sensory sort of performance mm. work with when you've got light and um, bodies and action and movement and narrative yeah. stories, smells, the whole package. Um, maybe, uh, I think yeah, Jim just, um, he did it with par excellence and, and gave the sort of license in a way to not worry so much about the connection between these different, um, like, senses, but, um, yeah, the, in a traditional way, like not worrying about it, but um, if the idea's there, then you can use you can use um, whatever you feel like mm. using, and whatever's there. And what, but yeah, I mean, I for for the piece I did, I was certainly influenced by the the ritualistic um, space of the of mm. this chapel as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering if any of the trustees in the audience had that conversation with Jim Allen about his feeling t t towards this as a as a place of what what once was a place of worship. You know, if if he had a connection to the re religious aspect of this whole project. Um, I wonder if Nick Bevan had that conversation. Isn't that Nick? Nick gone? Okay, we've, we've lost Nick. Um, uh, might be interesting to put that question to some of the family because um, we're privileged to have uh, the um, a large component of Jim's fun hour here. Uh, Pam, his wife's here. Um, daughter Ruth, who was collaborating. Um, uh, his sons, you know, and their wives. His uh, Jim's youngest son, Ben, and his son. I mean, they're all here, it's amazing. <laughs> so well, it's... Well, um, probably the simple question is, what, 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 did he th what do you think he thought of the chapel later in life? Did he, um, did he cherish this memory of this project? Did it remain alive and relevant to him? Chris, it, yeah. um, Subside. Yes, he gave, him, he gave him the opportunity to be involved with this chapel, to John Scott, Yeah. Um, were able to build it because they 
that is interesting for me, mm. and you, I hope, <laughs> is that the Marx brothers built the church. So John Scott had to think of how to put it together for them, mm. who they were not um, skilled. Mm. And Jim had to think of how to make the windows for them to create them. Mm. And they're square to plastic, I think, and they're all shuttled in, lot, um, pushed down through a pipe. That's not what it is, but you know, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, assembled yeah. in a structure. Yeah. That's a different thing. <laughs> cool. There we go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, my name is Chris. I'm one of James's sons. Uh, so, uh, querying um, Jim as far as there were several uh, crucifixes that he uh, actually carved um, during his career. So, I asked the question, you know, did they have a, a spiritual meaning to him? Um, and the fact that uh, he was in the war, and there's that saying that, you know, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Um, but no, there was no spiritual content for Jim in actually doing those. Um, it was creating an art form, um, understanding the body, understanding what it would look like in various forms when it was hung on the cross, etc., and um, exploring that side of it. Sorry. Any, any other comments? I have just one comment which um, shifts us away from Jim, really, just to, to sort of make the comment that it must have been, a, it's a remarkable time that the church would commission such a wonderful building. Um, of course, the Catholic Church has been a great patron of contemporary art, but I think the 60s was probably the last decade or two that they were. And I have to take my hat off to the church to um, provide two great artists, John Scott and Jim Allen, the opportunity to do something as experimental and wonderful as this. Would um, any church do that today? I, there, there seems to me that there was a particular moment in the history of the church where they actually had very forward-looking ideas about engaging with artists. Yeah. I, think, I think it was always a bit of a struggle, like I do know it, when Fortuna was opened, um, there was some resistance to it, obviously. You know, the old guard came in and said it, the Stations of the Cross by Jim were too kind of um, stylized and expressionistic, and um, someone even basically paid for the, uh, the mosaics, which are rather more conservative, um, and, you know, by the, um, by the side altars there to be put in place, which are a little bit of an affront to the Stations of the Cross above, and they were intended to be. They were paid for by a very um, conservative member of the um, parish, and um, by all accounts, Jim and John Scott were always slightly appalled that they got away with putting some more, another visual element. It's meant to just be white yeah. stone underneath the Stations of the Cross, which I mean, is, and the white stone is meant to push light back into the room too. So part of this whole thing, the whole place is a light box, you know, it's a kind of a, it's a very kind of a, as I say, a kind of like a, the, a, a natural kind of theater of effects. Um, but I am pleased about today, we're getting some really good um, um, Jim Allen effects on the wall. And you notice how this moves around all, as, the, as time goes on. Perhaps the other thing I'll mention, because Pamela mentioned it, the, um, at the moment, um, We've raised the money to um, replace, replace the very faded um, perspex panels in the windows up there, which is a very big job, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollar job. But basically, they've never been replaced there. Um, how many years old are they? They're 62 years old. Um, so they're faded quite a lot. So we should be getting much pingier blues. So if you do look at the, um, the book, actually, I'll just spruik the book now. If anyone would like a copy of the Fortuna book, um, which has lots of quotes from Jim Allen in it, amongst other things, um, uh, Koha of $20, and there's a pile of copies of it there. And if you haven't got cash on you, you can put some money in the Fortuna bank account, whatever, but so the book's there anyway. But when you look at a lot of the photos from 20 or 30 years ago, um, you can really see that incredible, almost not violent colour, but really vivid, active, um, vital kind of colour effects that were... Um, you know, what, what was there, and, and which are still there, just a tiny bit diminished, but still looking kind of gorgeous. Great. 
I think it's a wonderful thing, you know, architect and artist working together, and I don't think there's enough of that. I'm um, not quite sure why that is. But artists often do want to be extended, and, um, and I think that sort of a collaboration is really, really interesting. Um, this is so beautiful. Um, I think that um, there are so many skills, you know, that uh, Jim has, uh, sort of like uh, classical traditional skills and then kind of more um, uh, modernist, um, beautiful kind of uh, minimal, and um, he's like very many faceted. And I think too that, um, um, say when I was at university and learning um, processes and if I could find the information there, then I'd go out and find the information. Having those processes at your fingertips then I think kind of is amazing in that it's just that kind of um, eye, mind, hand thing. And then you know, you're saying how he became really prolific and can, could do kind of like photocopying and all sorts of things. And it's sort of like that kind of, once you've kind of got that language, um, then you are quite liberated and released and then can come back to it again and you know, go off in different tangents. And do you know what I mean? It's sort of like, um, yeah, I think that was good for me at Elam. I sort of encouraged to do lots of different things, but I, I um, you know, did have those kind of skills to um, approach in lots of different ways and to evolve um, and you know, ways of thinking and and um, um, the experience, thinking about the experience of the viewer, how they are affected, um, mm. looking at work. Um, yeah. Mm. When I, when I think of Jim, um, of Jim Allen, I think there's two images I have in my, of him in my head. One of them is one that's in the book, The Skin of Years, which is him holding a sextant, standing on a yacht. Um, very muscular, very, he's a monumental figure, holding a sextant, looking out to sea, taking his bearings. So he's a, he's a, he's a sea captain. But the other um, image I have of him, which is um, basically a big ink drawing on the wall of Robert Oliver, I'm not sure if he's still here, who's here earlier, Jim Allen did a big um, ink drawing, this would be like, a, this would be talking in the 50s, I think, of Don Quixote, but it's almost like a self-portrait, it's a figure on a donkey. It's a fantastic, you know, big drawing, um, which I actually, if I'd been more organised, I would have brought it in so we could have had it here, but he's, uh, he's also the person dreaming the dream, but also kind of like doing the hard work, doing, you know, standing in a, up in a storm and finding a way through it. Um, so I kind of, maybe this is a question for everyone, we could start from Tim, but I mean, so, <coughs> The, sp the spirit of Jim Allen is still kind of alive, do you think? And what, what are people, on a more broader sense, maybe looking, yeah, he's, is, he re is he relevant, is he alive? Um, what do you reckon? <laughs> oh, well, I'll just, I'll just say yes, um, absolutely. And I mean, you know, that idea of relevance often oscillates <laughs> up and down, you know, like performance art might, like social practice art, it might come in and out in terms of fashionability. Um, but I think the relevance is always there. I actually think there is a, a re-emergence of um, performance work going on now. And I think, again, uh, the a bit like probably in, her, in Jim's time, there's a saturation of um, objects and focus on the commercialization of artwork um, rather than making art interesting, making it in different environments and uh, the galleries supporting that, or the, the gallery structures. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, um, Jim, like, really, uh, he, he just gave a freedom to believe in your idea, support it with any technique um, that you wanted to pull, where, and it, it could be a very formal approach, it could be a traditionally um, classical sculptural approach or whatever, if that supported the idea, I don't think Jim would ever argue against that. Mm -hmm. So that, in a, as a as a overarching sort of idea, I, I think it would support his ongoing relevance. Apart from his addressing of, of 
interrogation of ideas of technology and communication. But then I reckon, Phil, the, the fact that Jim was exhibiting in his last years, and also you did the book, um, The Skin of Years, um, definitely a resurgence of an interest from students and younger people too, eh? Do you think? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, I think um, the legacy of Jim is uh, began to will become more and more important, in fact. Mm. People will recognise that um, what he, he was vanguard in that area and mm. um, he just opened the doors to possibilities and people have really flown with it. Mm. I mean, you look at the, in terms of performance now, um, it's very much in the field, actually, of uh, Pacifica and Polynesian artists. Mm. I mean, they're really doing a lot of performative work mm. and that's so interesting, you know. I mean, I don't know where they probably wouldn't even know about Jim a lot, a lot of people won't, a lot of new artists won't yeah. know about Jim, but um, they will become aware of him, I think, you know, yeah. eventually, because um, I think, yeah, his, his legacy is gonna become, yeah, more important within gallery context or whatever, mm. yeah. Mm. Tina, what do you reckon? <laughs> well, I firstly feel really um, pleased to have actually known him and also, to, you know, known the next generation and people like Phil. And that first-hand contact is very, very special. But I actually think that um, people can be forgotten, things can be lost, and it's a very, very fragile history that we're talking about. And I think that there's work to be done, and that's what encourages me to keep going. If you hadn't stumbled across the new art book, you might not have known about that work. Um, if I hadn't decided to do a thesis on it, you know, a whole range of um, artists' works might not have been well known. If certain galleries hadn't, you know, um, shown the work or created opportunities. Actually, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done to secure the legacies mm. of the artists that matter, but who are in danger of being forgotten. So, mm. you know, it doesn't it doesn't happen miraculously. I, I think in some ways there are young artists who d still don't know about Jim Allen. There are young artists working in a, what we would call a post-object um, tradition or a post-conceptual tradition who are only looking overseas because they didn't know that there are actually people who made that kind of work here because it's still actually quite hard to find when you visit a major museum. You, you don't walk in and see an amazing array of, um, you know, video works, installations and um, historical works from that era. They just haven't been collected. So there is absolutely work to be done. Be nice to maybe we should invite some questions from the audience. What do you think? <laughs> we're going to be running out of time, but yes, let's have. Let's, have, we got, have we got any questions from the audience? Or Liz, did you have something you wanted to say about that? Between John Scott and the friends, yeah, John Scott and, and, uh, and Jim Allen. Yeah. Just are, there, are there family I'm stories that would be nice to hear? Share that. I think they're all they're all too young. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of the thing. Um, I'll tell you a story. The, the story that I really like. Ruth, come and get the microphone. Can you hear me? Get the microphone, darling. Hey, I'm on the side. Okay. I was saying, I'm Ruth, I'm Jim's daughter. I was saying that um, one story that I really like that he told me when he was carving Jesus Christ was that he was living with the monks and he'd just left his first wife and he was carving Jesus in the stable with the animals because he had no money and not really anywhere to go. So he was kind of reliving this um, Bethlehem kind of scenario whilst carving Jesus and he said it was one of the highlights of his life in a way because at the end of the day they would 
have these big spreads of table with all of this fantastic food and drink copious amounts of wine. <laughs> so it was a really good time to, to get together and talk and I suppose build the chapel. I think certainly when you read the quotes in the book, um, as you know, Chris, I mean, you certainly I think um, Jim and John inspired each other mightily. I mean, one of those amazing moments, really. Um, okay, everyone, I think maybe we're going to run out of time, but has anyone got any questions or for any of the panellists here today? I'm just going to say about oh. what Tina was saying about oh. the internationalism, that um, there is a... Um, tendency to be thinking that whatever is done internationally is kind of better than what is produced here, but there's actually huge amounts of talent in New Zealand, and as Tina said, we need to celebrate that and not forget. Um, I think, yeah, that there's lots of incredibly talented people here, but music, writing, art, all sorts of things, mm. um, not to be forgotten. And too, I think in, just in Greg's notes, um, <coughs> you mentioned that um, no, Jim worked collaboratively. I do too work collaboratively with people and Robin. Um, and, but there are times too when you work just on your own and that's really kind of that aloneness, stillness is really kind of um, important and I can sense that in his work too. Mm -hmm. That um, that's when you kind of um, sort of refresh and um, your mind starts inquiring again. And so you're kind of open and receptive. Um, yeah, I guess that's the paradox here. You've got a building that's designed for groups of people, for community, for social interaction, but actually at the core of the building is it's a retreat chapel. It's about inwardness, about, in a way, probably the audience, the people here having that same kind of experience as the artist yeah. of being in a place and, um, you know, somehow channeling the richness of that. That's right. I, I just think, too, being in here, you've got the intimacy here, but it feels like that actually could open up and then um, you know, there's heaps of light to sort of bathe mm -hmm. you and sort of almost dissolve, dissolve the, the physicality. Yeah. Mm. I know that ph philosophically John Scott always believed that buildings often had a purpose beyond their original purpose. You know, so I do think probably today we can feel very confident. I mean, John Scott would love the idea that this is now a forum for the kind of art, performance and 